Hey guys, today's sermon, I hope you guys are doing well. Today's sermon is called The Silent Scream. Um, many people scream silently. Um, they have, they're outwardly they look okay, they smile, they go to work, they go to school, but internally, they're inside, they're crying out for help, they're screaming, and they're going through what Bishop Jakes would call a crushing, and because of that crushing, they're screaming silently, and they are they are just having a hard time and nobody knows it and that's what today's sermon is about um but before i really get into the meat of the sermon today ah uh, let's pray father i bless you god and i pray that you will fill my mouth with your word cause rachel to die and christ to live god I pray, Lord God, that you would hide me behind the cross. Let me speak things that I didn't even plan. Um, guide me in the way you want me to take, oh God. And I pray that you'll make every heart receptive, every mind alert to your truth. God, God I ask this in your precious son's name, the name of Jesus. Um, in the name of Jesus, amen. Um, the silent scream is all of the things that we as people try to hide. We as people um, try to dress up and make it look like something it is not. Um, we try and make it look, we try and make our lives look so not perfect because we all know that nobody's perfect, but we try and gloss over the issues in our lives and God is calling for a sound. He wants the silent scream to come out. I think I, in fact, I know that people operate the silent scream in so many different ways. Some people scream uh, through um, having affairs on their wives. Some some people scream through uh, social media. Uh, some people really scream through social media. Some people scream through um, just being silent. And the Lord, the Lord desperately today wants people to be free wants people to know that they don't have to suffer in silence. They don't have to say that everything's okay, oh yeah, everything's good, and then go home and then struggle with what they're struggling with. To, to illustrate this, I was thinking of, um, uh, last week I did uh, my sermon called uh, The Case of the Uneaten Chicken. And in that, I, I told the story of Bobby and Brenda and how um, they went through problems in their marriage where Bobby um, just kind of neglected Brenda and neglected his children, um, Melissa, Emily, and Ryan. Um, and then I told how God, uh, through counseling and God's grace, he restored their family. A totally fictional story, and I got great feedback on it uh, from uh, those who have listened to it. And so, to illustrate this, this point, um, this point about the silent scream. Um, I'm going to do kind of the same thing I did last week, which is to 
tell a story and to preach at the same time. So, using the exact same characters, the children of these characters, I'm going to illustrate um, the silent screen. So, last week I talked about Bobby and Brenda. This week I'm going to talk about Melissa, Emily, and Ryan, the children, and how different people uh, scream in different ways. Um, so let's start with their first girl, Melissa. Uh, M Melissa, as I, I said before, Bobby was a pastor, and so she grew up in the in the kind of environment that fostered love and fostered God. And even when her parents were going through that marriage, um, marriage issues, she still grew up in that kind of environment. But when they were going through that issue in their marriage, um, her mother was t so taken up with the fact that um, her father wasn't paying attention to her and they kind of, the children kind of got lost. And how it affected Melissa was one day she, her parents weren't fighting they didn't fight, but everything was silent. Like, they wouldn't talk to each other. They would barely say anything to each other. Uh, when her mother would ask her father a question, her father would be too busy planning a sermon. So, this silence in the house, and this not talking about what was going on in their house caused Melissa to keep everything that she was going through inside. All the uncertainty, all the pain, all the wondering if, did I do anything? Did I, could I do anything differently? And then, so, all this pain from her parents, um, disagreements, and all this angst that she had, were they gonna get divorced, what was gonna happen, caused her to really keep all that bottled pain inside. And because she didn't talk to her mother, because her mother was too busy and her her father was too preoccupied, they didn't see poor Melissa just struggling. Because the thing with Melissa was she still kept her grades up. She still did everything that she was supposed to do. So there was no outward sign that she was struggling. And what happened was Melissa um, met Andrew at school. Uh, Melissa, when she was about 16, met Andrew at school. And Andrew was a year older than Melissa. He seems to be more wise than Melissa. He was really cute. Uh, Melissa was like, oh, and was like, oh, I can finally talk to someone. And they became really close really quickly. And what happened to Melissa was um, Andrew wasn't the kind of guy that Melissa thought uh, he was, like this kind, caring guy. Um, and she, Melissa started to hear that um, Andrew, let's back, let's say this, 
Andrew started pressuring Melissa for sex. Now, because Melissa grew up in a Christian home, she knew that sex before marriage was not a good idea. She had heard all the sermons. She'd been to all the youth groups, read all the books on abstinence, knew what God expected of her. But when, when someone comes along and feeds a need and says, all you need for me to do is, is all I need for you to do for me to keep on feeding this need is this one compromise, this one thing. So at first, Melissa laughed it off and joked about it and said, oh no, don't be silly. But as Andrew pressured her and pressured her and pressured her, she gave in and slept with him. So after she did that, she felt so bad and the shame was so much. But because her parents were going through what they were going through, she didn't say anything. She didn't see any. She didn't say anything and they didn't see anything. Um, so the shame of that um, caused her to really go downhill, caused her to get really depressed. And she, one of the girls at school, one of his ex-girlfriends uh, told her that Andrew was t telling the whole entire school that they had slept together. And because of whatever social media and whatever, the whole school knew and everything was, um, everyone was laughing at her, everyone was calling her a slut, everyone was, it was just constant bullying, constant body shaming. Every time she would go on her uh, social media sites, she would, uh, uh, she would, um, do, she would, uh, see horrible memes and all this stuff. And she, because she was so quiet and so shy, she would just internally laugh it off. Like, oh, it doesn't bother me. Kids will be kids. I made a mistake. God knows me. God loves me. But inside, she was screaming. She was screaming for help. And nobody understood that. Um, her friends are like, oh, I admire the fact that, you, that you're um, going through all this. Um, and you're still able to be confident. But she wasn't uh, confident. She was actually hurting, but she didn't want people to know she's hurting. I want to talk here um, just briefly about the cover of confidence. And sometimes confidence is a good thing. Healthy confidence is necessary. But sometimes, I know for me, sometimes confidence could be a cover. So be careful when people are overly confident or they seem confident, but that confidence doesn't, they have to tell everybody their confidence. Um, they have to show people that they're confident. Um, real healthy, confident people don't need to say anything. Um, their actions say that they're confident. Their demeanor says that they're confident. Be careful of people that are always saying, oh, I'm confident and always um, filling themselves up with pride and saying, 
I got this, I can do it. Um, cause sometimes, sometimes it's real, not authentic, but sometimes it isn't. And this is what was going on with Melissa. This false air of confidence that she put on and she was actually uh, really hurting but she didn't know how to how to how to tell her parents and how to tell her mom and her dad and what happened was one day um, it was the last straw she came into school and one of the girls had written all over her locker um, something awful. Uh, he, she had written, um, kill yourself, you, you, and she used a curse word, which I'm not going to say here, but you can imagine. She said, kill yourself, you beep, and then, and then Melissa shrugged it off and laughed. But really internally, that was it for her. She, it kept on building and building and building and building and building until she just couldn't take it anymore. So she went into the bathroom. She grabs something sharp. And she started self-harming. She put a tiny cut on her finger and watched it bleed. And that outward sign helped her deal with her internal pain. And from that day, she started self-cutting every time something would appear on social media something would happen uh, to her, anything, anyone would mention Andrew, that's what she started to do. And along, and as it started with little cuts, but then it ended up to be bigger and bigger and bigger cuts. Because sometimes when you start when you start doing something and you start doing it a little bit and you don't get caught, it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. But, but that self-harming was not, it wasn't dealing with what was going on inside. It was actually harming what was going on inside because as it built and built and built and built, she just internally continued to spiral out of control. And there was one day where something really awful happened, uh, where Andrew, she saw Andrew uh, with another girl, with her best friend Katie, because she had told Katie, all the issues with Andrew and everything. And she went on Katie's Facebook one day or Katie's Instagram and saw pictures of her and Andrew. So she had been self-harming, self-cutting for a while now, but this time she actually went into the bathroom and cut a vein. And she cut so deep that she started to really bleed out um, so badly that the, her teacher had to come and find her because she was in class and she excused herself to go to the bathroom. But um, when she didn't come back, the teacher had to go and find her. And when she found her, um, she had she had almost bled out. She almost died because of this internal pain. Because 
people need to put pain somewhere. If you don't put pain somewhere, it'll it'll pain will come out in whatever way it can. So if you don't speak about it, if you don't talk about it, it won't go away. It will come out in whatever way it can. And that that cutting, that thing that she did, that self-harm, uh, it came out in that way from Melissa. So Melissa was rushed to the hospital and blessedly, um, she was, they were able to revive her and she lived. And um, the family was able to get therapy for what was going on and in that therapy session um, Brenda and Bobby realized what Melissa was going through and how this marital disagreement was was affecting Melissa and through counseling she was able to get her um, the cutting under control and sometimes when you're doing anything, when you're self-harming, when you're drinking, it's a way to cry, help, I need help. And I will say for the last part of this video, I will say to parents, parents, please foster communication with your kids. Because I'm not a parent yet, but I was a kid. And I can tell you, um, I can tell you, we may, we may not say that we need you, but we do. We may not act like we, we're listening, but we are. And no matter how busy you are, foster communication with your kids. Start from the time they can talk. Start from very young to ask how was your day how are things going be interested in their lives don't be so caught up with working caught up with stuff that you miss your kids i said last week to um bring god in a way that that's fun and they can understand well i'm saying that with communication just foster communication at their level whatever age they are because if you foster that now they'll tell you when things are going on they'll tell you when things are wrong they'll tell you when things are right a lot of people nowadays are so busy with themselves that they forget that their children need them I know you need to provide, you need to work, you need to do all that, but you need to understand that you're raising this generation and this generation is crying out for mamas and papas that actually care, that actually see them, that can actually pull them aside and love them and say, you don't have to do this. Parents, your children need you. Your children want guidance. The reason why my character Melissa was cutting herself and harming herself because there was no one listening because Brenda and Bobby were so focused on their issues and Melissa was doing so outwardly well. Her, her grades were okay, everything seemed to be okay with her, but inside she was screaming and they didn't see it until it was too late. And when it's too late, it's too late. So be a part of your children's lives from the age of babies to the age of uh, in their 20s to whatever age and be non-judgmental. A lot of children don't talk to their parents, not because they don't want to, 
not because they think their friends are more important. It's not because of any of that, but because they're afraid that their parents will judge them. Parents, this generation is much different than your generation. And they need a place where they won't be judged. If your child comes home and says, Mom, Dad, I'm gay, the first thing you do is say, we love you. They need to know that all the time. They need to know that whatever, what, whatever you do, whatever you think you are, I may not always agree with you, I may not understand you, but I love you. And I think that a lot of, a lot of ch children really don't feel loved by, they, by their parents. They hear it, but they don't feel it. And I've learned in my life, there's a difference between hearing I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, and then actually feeling loved or saying you can come talk to me about every anything and everything and then them hearing you gossip about your friends on the phone and you think they're going to come talk to you children respond by action they don't respond by word and people respond by action so it's not what you say it's what you do and i think that Sometimes we are so we are so worried about being uh, biblical in what the church is that we forget that those children are our children, that they are still our children, no matter what they do, no matter who they are, no matter what they are involved in, they still are our children, and they need our love they need they need a place that is safe that they know they can bring who they are they can bring all their mess to the table and they know that you will help them without judgment if you can't help them you'll find counseling you'll be there you'll find love you'll find everything for them and they they need to know that you care they don't just need to hear that you care because hearing that you care is one thing, but knowing that you care is entirely something different. It's, it's totally different to hear that, oh, I care about you, I love you, and see no action to, towards it rather than to, to see that you care and feel it. Because Sometimes people say things, um, but the person saying it doesn't show it. So we can say all this stuff on social media about how we love our family members and how our children are so important. But if we don't see it in our daily lives, then it's just good words. And I think the world is tired of good words. We want people that act out what they live out, what they, what they speak or what they say. And that is the same for our children. They're desperately wanting love. They're desperately wanting acceptance. They're desperately wanting to say, you know what, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, I accept you. And acceptance doesn't mean you condone everything that a person does. Acceptance means no matter who you are, I embrace you. I don't, you don't have to agree with them, but you have to respect them and you have to accept who they are. And when a person knows that you accept who they are and respect their decision, despite your personal view, they will open up to you like you wouldn't believe. And because 
back to my fictional story, Bobby and Brenda didn't do this. Uh, that is why Melissa ended up in so much trouble. And it took counseling, it took doctors, it took dietitians to help Melissa restore who, who she was. It took prayer, it took, first of all, before all, all the dietitians and the doctors, it took a talk with her parents, it took God, it took her bowing before the Lord and saying, God, this is who I am. I messed up. When she, when Melissa woke up from the hospital room before anything happened, she said, God, I need you. God, I made a mess of this with Andrew. God, I love you. Fill me. Let me know what to do. And it's because of that prayer, her family was, she was able to be restored to what God wanted her to be. And so many people are crying out. It may not be cutting, it, it may be something else. It may be drinking, it may be pornography. But whatever you're doing to stifle pain, stop it. Get help. There is help out there. There is hope out there. There is freedom out there. You don't have to live in the darkness of pain. You can come to the light and be free. It is possible. And it doesn't matter how many people in your family were cutters. It doesn't matter how many people in your family were molested. You can make a change today. Decisions, okay. A new life is only a decision away. So, change is only a decision away. If you want to change, if you want a new life, nobody can make you do it. All, all they can do is help you once you make that decis decision. You, you, you have to want to change. Change is possible, but it's not possible unless you take the first step. Unless you say, I'm broken, I'm messed up, I'm an alcoholic, unless, or I cut, I, whatever you do, unless you're man enough, woman enough to say, I need to change, it won't happen. You have to make a conscious choice that I need to change, I want to change. Um, a lot of people uh, want to change, but they just don't say it. And, and because they want to change and are silent about it, they don't, they don't change. Because what you're silent about uh, can't help you. But what you what you voice can can start you on the journey to change. So don't just want to change in your heart. Go to somebody today. First of all, go to God and say, God, I want to change. And then go to a pastor, go to a friend, go to a professional and say, listen, I want to change. Tell me how. There are tools out there for any addiction, any things that you're in. But all you, all you have to want to do is change. All you have, you have to do is want to change. The rest will follow. But if you don't want to change, there is nothing that your doctors could do. There's nothing that your counselors can do. There's nothing that anyone can do. You have to want to change. Change is possible. Hope is possible. Freedom is possible. Anyone that tells you it's not possible to be free from addictions, it's not possible to be free from eating disorders, it's not possible to be free from 
mental health issues is lying. It's just a decision away. If you make the decision, then healing can follow. Whether it be counseling, whether it be medication, whether it be uh, just simple prayer, whether it be a dis um, simple decision to forgive and and have a, a candid conversation with whoever you need to have that candid conversation with. And stop hiding behind your your proclivity and propensity. Come out. You can't you can't change what you don't acknowledge. That's what Dr. Phil says, and I believe that so that that is true. Once you make the decision to change, the rest is a process, but at least you made the conscious decision. To change and there are people to help you father I thank you for what you've done and I thank you for what you've spoken today God and I pray that you permeate every heart every spirit every soul God go into us and infiltrate us with your spirit Lord cleanse us from all unrighteousness in the name of Jesus amen so guys Thank you for listening to this. I love you all. Bye.